subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. The Print of the Cuff, presented by IIFL Wealth and Asset Management, corporate partner, AU Small Finance Bank, in association with global insurance brokers, airline partner SpiceJet. Thank you very much and thank you. This is a very important, uh, very important fill in the blanks in our history and understanding of China. So tell us, uh, first of all, what happened in 1989? Tell us, a, tell us a young watcher's story. You were still learning to be a China specialist. Thank you. Thank you, Shekhar. Thank you for inviting me on your program. Uh, and thank you for introducing my book. Uh, this book is a labor of love because I was still in my 20s when the Tiananmen incident happened. And for me, this was probably the most important event that I witnessed in the 1980s. And so it stayed on in my memory. Uh, it stayed on also because I kept asking myself whether to believe the Western narrative that this was an upsurge of democracy in the Chinese people, or to accept the Chinese narrative, which was that this was in fact a small handful of people who were determined to topple the communist system, or whether it was something which was different from both these versions. And uh, in the course of the past 30 years, as a result of reading and talking to people and returning back to Beijing, uh, my conclusion was that uh, while at one level uh, there was a strong movement among the students uh, because there was dissatisfaction as a result of poor economic performance and so on, at another level it was a struggle within the Communist Party. It was basically a factional struggle and the factions tried to use the students and eventually spun out of control. I wrote the book because I think that although this is a historical event, although it is recent history, but you cannot understand China today without understanding what happened in 1989, because Shekhar, as we know, the same party rules China even today. It is stronger, uh, it is more powerful, it has greater capacities economically, militarily, and diplomatically. And I felt that as a close neighbor, Indians cannot afford to ignore China any longer. And by that, I mean the ordinary Indian public. Uh, and therefore, I wrote the book, hopefully, in a style which I felt might be easier to read, uh, particularly among the younger generation. So you were in your 20s then. Uh, so you were even younger than us. We thought we were very young then. Uh, but just take us back. Take us back to the scene. Where were you? Uh, were you asleep, awake in office when the big crackdown took place? And when did you first get out and what did you see? Well, it of course began on the 15th of April when uh, the former General Secretary uh, Hui Aobang, who at one stage had been Deng Xiaoping's nominee for his successor, but whom he subsequently abandoned because of differences on political reform, died suddenly of a heart attack. Now, uh, the uh, upsurge of empathy and sympathy that arose in the universities was an interesting phenomenon. And that's where it really began. It began in the universities. So you made a very important statement in the beginning. You said that you cannot understand China of today unless you understand 1989 and Tiananmen. Uh, explain that, please. Yeah, so my um, contention, which I bring out at the, in the last chapter of the book, Shekhar, is that uh, here is a party which is dedicated to self-perpetuation, uh, which has in the course of the past 30 or 40 years brought about economic reform and a better standard of life, but in the process has abandoned communism as an ideology to be practiced. Of course, they preach it, but they don't practice it anymore. Uh, what is in fact substituted, uh, it is a sense of nationalism, national pride. And sometimes that becomes ultra-national sentiment, which in a sense is dangerous. Now, uh, the same uh, 
aristocracy which uh, ruled China in 1989 continues to rule there today. These are children of the first and second generation leaders. Their entire uh, objective is to preserve and perpetuate their power. And therefore, it is extremely important for other countries, particularly countries like India, which are neighbors to China, to understand what is happening in China today. And for that purpose, you need to see what happened in 1989. Uh, even the Chinese uh, say that 1989 was such an important turning point for them that it continues to influence them today. Just last month, the Communist Party brought out a short history of its past 100 years. And in that, there is one particular statement which says that it is the incident of 1989 which compelled the party to look in a cool-headed manner at its present and its future. So I think that gives us a clue that the party continues to draw major lessons from the 1989 incident in its effort to perpetuate its rule for the next 100 years beginning from this year. One of the points I do want our readers to take away from the book is that although we imagine the Communist Party to be a monolith, uh, in fact, within the party, there is a lot of factionalism and a lot of differences of opinion. Uh, now, the, the benefit we get from the Tiananmen incident is that for a very short while, for a window of maybe 60 days, we got a good look at how that operates. So although there were strong men and there are strong men and strong leaders in China, whether that is Mao or Deng or presently Xi Jinping, uh, we should not assume that there is absolute unity and that the entire party and country are marching to the tune of one person. Uh, we must presume that there are differences of opinion and we need to be alert on, and on the lookout as to when that might spill over uh, into a, a movement or bring about some amount of political change, while of course being practical enough to recognize uh, and I do believe the, the government of India is practical enough to recognize that we have to do business with the China that is the China of today. So do you think Xi Jinping's Communist Party also, there are differences of opinion and internally people are either questioning him or fretting or sharpening their knives? I don't doubt it, Shekhar, because a, a few uh, recent developments, uh, particularly during the post-COVID period, indicate this. Uh, what has begun is a purge within the public security organs of the state. That is the People's Armed Police, the PLA and the Public Security Bureau. Uh, now, you don't normally purge internal security organs unless you are concerned that there might be elements of resistance within uh, the security forces. Xi Jinping, in a speech he gave uh, in February, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, he said that the most likely breach in the fortress will come from inside the fortress. He said in Chinese, and I, I quote this, Paole Romi Tsong Neipu Umpo. Now, that's an interesting statement because while publicly the Communist Party says that America and the West want to effect regime change, here is the top leader saying the real danger is not from outside the fortress, but within the fortress. That is the exact, and, exact translation of what he said in his language. Yes, he says that uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, main problem is it will come from within the fortress. Now, this is interesting because this also suggests that there is an underlying concern that the whole uh, purpose of the party has got diluted over the past 70 years as this prosperity and wealth and power uh, allow the, the carders to enjoy themselves. Uh, so another interesting theme that is now repeatedly being said by uh, the top leadership is the need to inherit the red gene. Uh, so uh, uh, the red gene, in other words, uh, the DNA of the next generation of the top of the of the carders needs to be uh, uh, infused with the red gene so that they continue the communist tradition. Uh, we do know now that in 1962, and this is also based upon memoirs of some of the Chinese leaders which are surfacing in the last few 62, years. 62 was the peak of the Great Leap Forward disaster. Yes. 
it was actually the time when mao was being blamed for the great leap forward and uh, needed distractions and uh, uh, it is believed that uh, certainly the attack on india was part of that distraction at a time when the soviets and the americans were locked in the cuban missile crisis so although there is no hard evidence to back the fact that what they did in april might have been for that that could certainly be one of the reasons what there is no doubt about is that this was a very deliberate action they took uh, and uh, this was not the action of a local commander uh, or, or even of a local theater commander it had to have sanction from the top and in a sense uh, um, uh, what they did broke the vivendi the modus vivendi which had worked for three decades after 1988 and we have to deal with the new situation now and 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 they did it deliberately so they wanted to break the borders we went there uh, yeah i certainly believe that i certainly believe it to be the case well i wouldn't say they wanted to break the borders by wind i think they perhaps wanted to uh, cause us problems to damage us in some way uh, but it didn't quite work out that way i think the indian government's response uh, after the initial period was swift Uh, it was handled uh, in in a professional manner, and I think by the end of the year, uh, uh, we pretty much evened the score, as it were. Uh, now the saga is not yet over. I I'm not in the know of what is happening, but I understand that discussions are on. So I guess we have to uh, give it time. But I believe that we should not be in a hurry to conclude anything. Uh, 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 a job that is well done is better than a job done in haste. So. i think we need to allow the government a little more time to deal with the situation so there are there is one big argument right now one lot says that now the chinese are not sitting on any territory which we consider our own besides what they took in 1962 right the other is that no 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 but they've taken all this depsang area that they've taken area in hot springs and they've taken area in some other places what do you think is closer to the truth or what is the truth uh, shaker i don't think anybody says that the chinese are not sitting on our territory i think all political parties have agreed that they are in occupation of 33000 square kilometers of territory in assam and that they are laying yes laying claim to arunachal pradesh uh, i think that some of these issues are legacy issues you talk of depsang that is a legacy issue Uh, for a, uh, quite a number of years uh, both sides have been patrolling this area with no definitive control by either side and perhaps uh, neither side uh, sought to impose control because of certain uh, geographical and, and weather factors and so on now that does not mean that uh, there was no attempt by the chinese side over the last 10 years to encroach in a in a sort of almost permanent way there but i think that uh, we've been able to stop that uh, pretty effectively now i'm not by any means saying that therefore in on in every single inch of every single place we've been able to do so because this is an enormous territory barren extremely hostile and uh, there are no geographical features in in ladakh it's all flat land but uh, uh, i think there is no truth to rumor that a uh, large chunks of land have been taken over in the last few years by the chinese because uh, let me say this way because the indian army let down its guard i i don't believe that and since i have dealt with this for uh, a, a, a few years not recently but certainly till 2019 uh, i don't think that that uh, view is factually correct what has happened is that the areas to which we were patrolling they are stopping us the areas to which they were patrolling india is stopping them yes yes uh, now the, the one thing i do want to point out is uh, that if the chinese claim that we are nibbling away at their border which is what the claim is then i would think that the country which is being nibbled away will want the lac to be clarified normally somebody who is nibbling at it doesn't want it to be clarified they want to keep more and more therefore right. we have to ask the chinese side if indeed you feel india is nibbling away at your territory at what they claim is their territory why is it that they don't want the lac to be clarified and that question has an answer in it the answer is the nibbling is the other way around it is the chinese who are nibbling away 
It is we who say, let's stop this by clarifying the LAC. And the Chinese don't want that to happen because they want to keep on nibbling away. Uh, so I, I can, cannot find any other rational explanation for Chinese behavior. So what do the Chinese want? I mean, uh, is it purely local tactical that get a little more territory, get this height, this something? Or is, it, or is there a strategic motive? Because a country that size, a power that much bigger than India, it's unlikely that the motive can be like 1962, let me get this better, better tactical position, I'm on this height, he's on that height. So it's clearly not tactical, as you say. Uh, in 1962 also, it was strategic. Uh, Mao, now we know because uh, some of the uh, instructions of Mao Zedong are public, Essentially, Mao said that we need to teach India a lesson so that for the next 20 years, it will not try to challenge us and we will keep them in their place. That was the intention in 62. Uh, I don't know whether a similar intention was there in 2020 as well. Uh, but they, of course, need to also recognize the fact that the India of 2020 is not the India of 1962. Oh, I think uh, uh, China takes quad very seriously because uh, it has uh, decided that this is an institution or a mechanism or a platform which uh, has anti-China written all over it. Uh, what they are trying to do, however, uh, is that they are trying to confuse the concept of the Indo-Pacific with this mechanism. And there is no uh, um, uh, need to do that because the Indo-Pacific is a vision which India has, many other countries have as well. ASEAN has it, United States, Japan, Australia, they all have it. We all have different visions of the Indo-Pacific. It's a consultative process and it will come in. Quad is a mechanism. And uh, for, that, uh, for that matter, I mean, you know, the Chinese have a mechanism between Nepal, Pakistan, Afghanistan and, uh, uh, and China. That is also a quad. And then they have one between Afghanistan, Pakistan, Turkmenistan and China. That is also a quad. So how is this quad that we are in different from that quad which they are in? Um, I think sometimes uh, countries have been a little too polite in calling out the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, who practice one thing, preach one thing and practice another. Maybe I think now, however, countries are beginning to call them out. and They should be called out. Uh, they should also explain why they need to have counter coalitions of states. Uh, and isn't that, shouldn't we consider that to be anti Indian? Yeah, because also even BRI is some kind of a counter coalition. Uh, 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 yeah. In fact, uh, Shekhar, it is not only a counter coalition, it is a unilateral initiative. Yeah, it, In contrast, the Indo Pacific vision is not unilateral. It's not as if India or the Australia or the United States unilaterally decided this is a take it or leave it. We are all discussing it and we are adding elements to it from everybody else. The BRI, however, was a take it or leave it. It was unveiled in May 2017 in Beijing. I was there. I was the ambassador. Countries were told to come in and sign on on a piece of paper they had not seen before. And the Chinese are not willing to discuss uh, the larger issues and concerns around it. So that's I absolutely relevant. Look, uh, I think the Doklam issue is too recent and I don't want to get into the uh, to the details of it because I think that may not be proper at this time, particularly when the government is dealing with another crisis at the other end of the boundary. What I do want to say is that there was a very specific objective that the government of India had and which was articulated in parliament by our, by our uh, is, that ministers. That is, which is Jamperi Ridge. No, which is the tri-junction. In other words, whenever the borders of three countries meet, it has to be trilaterally decided where that meeting point is. And China did not appear to be adhering to that understanding. It was as simple as that. Now, we might well argue as to why a trilateral is important because it's just a point on the ground. But then there is a geostrategic significance to territory. And it has to be looked at from that perspective. Uh, and therefore, the government of India was compelled to act. And I think that, uh, again, that was a limited objective. And to my mind, we achieved the, the, the limited purpose we had set out. So besides that, what the Chinese are doing in the in area underneath it, which they claim theirs, but Bhutan claims its own, that is not such a big strategic concern for us. They were doing that, they were doing that even before 2017. Uh, uh, it, it was not as if the first time they appeared was in June of 2017. 
right from 2001, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or even perhaps 1999, uh, the comings and goings on were there. Uh, so, so it is not. It, it is a qualitatively new situation in the sense that now they have got some permanent presence, but uh, effectively they already had control because nobody else was going into that place. So, you know, whether they were permanently stationed, semi-permanently there, or just coming and going, really did not make much of a difference. So, how do you see the Bhutanese now being able to handle it going ahead? We saw this recent article in Xinhua blaming the British for Kashmir problem, which somebody we are all, fa all fans of, Lizzie and Zhao, uh, <laughs> put, it, put out a tweet threat on. And for some reason, hours after I had read the tweet, tweet threat, I had the privilege of being blocked by him. Uh, so what is that article saying? Because nothing happens in the Chinese system without somebody wanting it to happen. No, I, I think sometimes they do say things without necessarily thinking it through. And this was probably one of those things. Um, I, 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 their position is fairly well known. They claim that uh, this is a, a, a disputed territory and uh, uh, they continue to play with words. So when it suits them, they say it should be bilaterally resolved. When it suits them, they say UN Security Council has a role. Uh, but I think that uh, um, uh, I don't think we should read too much more into what Li Chen Tao says. He has a habit of uh, of uh, putting his. But, this, in but this article in Xinhua said that if if India was the crown, was a jewel in the British crown, then Kashmir is the crack in it. <laughs> maybe a transliteration of something more profound in Chinese language. But <laughs> no, I, I, I can't understand what the saying is in English. I think I ought to check the Chinese uh, text, but I haven't checked it. I, I think probably the trans it's something is lost in translation. Yeah. My own understanding is that uh, the current prime minister has had more or less continued the same policy of engagement as his predecessors. Yes, there was some change in style. There was a certain new realism that he brought in terms of articulating India's concerns. It is also true that uh, the Prime Minister felt that reciprocity is important. After all, this is a relationship between two equal powers. China talks of the five principles of peaceful coexistence. But in substantive terms, the policy of engagement continued. And the two summits were a solid proof of that commitment of the Prime Minister to engagement. Now, of course, engagement does not mean, and very rarely at the summit level means, an immediate solution to problems. That is not how the world works. And it is certainly not the way the Chinese work. So uh, my understanding was that these two summits were part of the engagement process for the two leaders to exchange views on a variety of subjects, because we are, after all, two of the major emerging countries in the world. Uh, so to, the short answer is, at least in my personal opinion, uh, the summits served a purpose. It was not intended to produce a, a, a sort of path-breaking result because that in any case, the, the two governments had made it clear before the summits were held. And I don't think that uh, it is a wasted effort. Now, of course, moving ahead, whether more summits will be held or not is something which people currently in government have to answer. I can't, I can't answer to that. The Print of the Cuff, presented by IIFL Wealth and Asset Management, corporate partner, EU Small Finance Bank, in association with global insurance brokers, airline partner SpiceJet, 